We're back. We're back in business. So let's talk about it. Our opening game of the season is a away fixture, a 12.30 kickoff against West Ham United on Saturday the 10th of August. We are facing our ex-manager Manuel Pellegrini. So let's have a look a little bit at the opposition we'll be facing. So last time they won at home on the opening day of the league was against Arsenal in 2015. Pretty good form going into the end of last season. The only game that they lost at home in 2019 was against Everton in March. So according to the news that I could find, goalkeeper Lucas Fabianski has recovered from a groin problem. And Jack Wiltshire, for once in his career, is fit. Mark Noble's going to be missing out because of a dead leg. So let's have a quick look at West Ham United's summer signings. So they've signed Albion Ajerti from Basel, undisclosed fee. Roberto from Espanyol for free. David Martin from Millwall on a free. Pablo Fornals from Villarreal for £24 million. Sebastian Haller from Eintracht Frankfurt for £45 million. Players they've let go, nothing really of note. Adrian's obviously been released now. Sami Nasri wasn't really getting many starts anyway, even though he's a, he was a quality player. And Andy Carroll has obviously gone and joined Newcastle. West Ham, really, I think they were just shoring up a few places, adding a bit of depth to their squad over the summertime. As far as I'm concerned, West Ham have got a pretty good squad. I predicted them not so long ago to finish about 10th in the Premier League this coming season. For me, this season for West Ham, it's all about how... Manuel Pellegrini utilises the players at his disposal. I mean, you, you look at some of the names they've got associated with them. Felipe Anderson, Jack Wiltshire, Manuel Lanzini, Declan Rice. We're expecting big things from him perhaps this season. The new signing, Sebastian Haller, is going to be quite exciting. They've got Javier Hernandez up front, Chicharito. So as long as he can get this team scoring with the with solid spying of players like Mark Noble in the team, I, I expect quite decent things from uh, from West Ham this season. Some of the problems that West Ham might have faced last season towards the end, I mean, they only kept seven clean sheets, so perhaps they've got to shore up a little bit, a little bit more defensively, and perhaps that might not be the greatest opening start against Manchester City, seeing as, seeing as Manchester City are known for our free-flowing attacking football, uh, and we like to score goals. I actually, I actually see West Ham as a decent proposition in the Premier League this season. I don't think they're going to set the world on fire. I think if they can get the goals scored and they can keep it tight at the back, obviously that's going to be important for them. I still, I'm still confident that they'll finish around the mid-table mark. So I expect West Ham to line up in pretty much this way. Fabianski at the back, Fredericks, uh, Beluina, Diup, Cresswell, Declan Rice, Jack Wiltshire, Felipe Anderson, Fornals, Lanzini and perhaps Haller up front, maybe Chicharito. But that's enough about West Ham United. Let's talk about the Mighty Blues. Let's talk about the reigning Premier League champions. So a bit of team news for you guys. Leroy Sane, as we all know, is going to be out for a number of months now. He's got a serious, serious knee injury that he suffered, obviously, against Liverpool last weekend. Mendy's going to be out probably for about the first month of the season. Laporte is also out with some niggles. That's a couple of weeks at best. Fernandinho's probably not going to start because uh, miss, after missing the fixture at Wembley, I'm not sure about Fernandinho. Maybe we see a start for Rodri. He had a, he had a solid game at Wembley, but depend all depends on Rodri's match fitness because obviously he's coming from a slower-paced, weaker league in Spain and he's played against pretty much our title contenders for this season last weekend. It would have been a tough test for him, but I think he's probably up for it. Gabby Jesus played uh, most of the game when he came on as a substitute for Leroy Sane at the weekend, just gone against Liverpool. So maybe this could be a start for Sergio. I'm expecting absolutely massive things from Aguero this season. The guy is our all-time leading goal scorer. He's just going to cause so many teams, so many problems this season. Obviously, people are thinking that he's coming towards the twilight of his year, but I think this is a big, big year for Sergio Aguero. Not re- He's not really got a lot to prove, but I think the only way that he's going to get on that Premier League team of the season this year is if he scores 30-plus goals, and I think he is more than capable of it. So obviously the big news for Manchester City in the last 24, 48 hours is that we've completed the signing of Cancelo, and we've also got in Scott Carson as a backup keeper. Don't think that Cancelo is going to be starting at the weekend. It's, highly, in my opinion, highly unlikely, but I've been wrong before. I think he'll just pretty much stick with a similar lineup that we saw against Liverpool at Wembley. So I'm expecting to see Edison obviously in goals instead of Bravo because Bravo is going. I think he's going to be our cup keeper again this year. Kyle Walker at, at right back, John Stones, Nico Otamendi because obviously Laporte's out injured. Zinchenko at left back. I think it's unlikely that Angelino will be brought in at left back, so I'm going to stick with Zinchenko. 
I expect to see Rodri if he's up to match fitness, maybe Fernandinho. Kevin De Bruyne, I think I, I had to question about this one. Now, I think if Leroy Sane wouldn't have got injured at the weekend against Liverpool, I actually fully expected um, Bernardo Silva to be starting in midfield with Kevin De Bruyne. But I think since the Leroy Sane injury, I think that plan's been put on hold for a while. So I think we'll see Dave Silva playing. I think he'll be wearing the captain's armband. Then obviously Bernardo Silva and Raheem Sterling out on the wings. And I'm going to go for Sergio Aguero up front. So for me, this game is going to be won and lost in the midfield. Now, Mark Noble is out. I think Mark Noble is a decent player, although I don't think pace has ever been an attribute that suited him. So, yeah, really, the battle is going to be won and lost in midfield in this game. West Ham have to soak up the pressure so much in that midfield area and try and dominate players like Kevin De Bruyne and probably David Silva. A massive, massive task. But let's look at that West Ham defence. It is a little bit on the slow side. I'm expecting that if that battle in midfield is lost by West Ham, those City wingers in Bernardo Silva and Raheem Sterling are just going to absolutely terrorise the fullbacks of West Ham. Having said that, I actually think that being the opening game of the season, being away from home, having just passed a very tough test against Liverpool in the charity in the Community Shield this weekend gone, I actually think that this one's going to be a closer game than some people might think. I'm still going to go for a Manchester City win. I still think that City will be the winners of this game, perhaps with a late goal or two for the opening game of the season away from home. City have got a pretty decent record now against West Ham, and West Ham do concede goals. And I do believe that our midfield is more than capable of dictating play, even away from home. So I expect it to be a very busy day for Diop and uh, Balbuena at centre-half. I think Fredericks and Cresswell are going to get terrorised potentially at right and left back. Declan Rice is potentially going to have his hands full trying to cover those gaps in that in that midfield area. They've got quite a potent attacking threat with Wiltshire, Lanzini and Anderson and obviously perhaps the new boy Haller up front. But I, I really think that it's going to be about their defensive game tomorrow. I really think that Anderson, Lanzini, Wiltshire and Farnells are really going to have to do a lot of work to help Declan Rice out in that midfield area and to also track back a lot cover a lot of runs and cover their back four now in July we did play against West Ham in the Premier League Asia Trophy we beat them 4-1 I wouldn't read a massive amount into that result I mean obviously we had a lot of kids out it was the summertime people were coming back from holidays quite a lot of our squad was missing it was quite a flattering result our, our youth did play really really well don't expect any of them to really feature tomorrow maybe Phil Foden from the bench is a possibility I think Garcia might be on the bench as well given that we're quite under strength at the minute at centre half but don't read too much into it into that pre-season game I'm just mentioning it now to say that you know because we have played West Ham in the not too distant past but I'm really expecting tomorrow to like I've said before, to be all about that midfield battle, depending on how much work rate that the West Ham team put in is, you know, that's that's the key really. Has has Manuel Pellegrini prepped them enough? Because they're going to have to work so, so hard helping Declan Rice out and helping their, their back four out. I, I think they're going to ride a lot of luck, take a lot of chances and maybe try and counter City on the break occasionally, but I really expect a lot of City pressure. I think they're going to be quite resilient for about 50, 60 minutes of the game, but I do expect this game to end with a 3-1 scoreline to Manchester City. Away from home, it's a bold prediction, City's opening day, but I think that we are, we've are we got enough form going into this, having played Liverpool in a tough test not that long ago. West Ham are going to be pretty resilient for the first 50, 60 minutes, but after that, I think we're going to get a couple of late goals. I think I think we'll score first, but then West Ham will get on, get us on the break at some point, or put a really West Ham will put a really concerted effort into to get their new season off to a, a decent start. But I think the class at the end of the ninety minutes will have shown, and Manchester City will end this game with a three-one away victory. So, what about the rest of the Premier League fixtures, you ask? Well, of course, traditionally, the Premier League should start with the reigning champions playing the first fixture of the season. And, of course, this year is no different. Liverpool, the net spend champions. You know, I swear with Liverpool, if they could be the first team to play in space, they would claim that they are the champions of the solar system. Still, of course, not the champions of England. 
the solar system's a different story. Anyway, let's get over that. They face Norwich. They're at home, Liverpool. I expect this to be a 5-0 route in favour of Liverpool. I'm sorry, Norwich fans out there. You're a newly promoted team. I just don't rate your chances this season. Liverpool are a very clinical team. I expect them to thrash you the opening game. Let's have a look at the rest of the fixtures on the Saturday, the 3 o'clock kickoffs. We have AFC Bournemouth versus Sheffield United. Sheffield United, a newly promoted team, Bournemouth a team with a budget of about 25 pence. I actually expect Sheffield United to give Bournemouth a cracking game, but unfortunately I'm going to go for an all-score draw to all. Burnley, the next of our games against Southampton at home. I actually fancy Burnley for this one, but I think it'll be a close game. 2-1 Burnley. Crystal Palace versus Everton. Will he, won't he? Zaha, now he's not going anywhere. Everton, what a team. They are my dark horses of the season. I expect them to be pushing for around the top six spots. So, Crystal Palace away from home on the first game of the season. You're thinking, hmm, tough test. Probably. I think Everton might just nick this one 2-1 away from home. Watford versus Brighton and Hove Albion. They've got Brian Potter and his garlic bread as a manager at Brighton. I don't actually see them getting anything out of this game. Watford, Troy Deeney, you're my man. 2-0 win for Watford at home. Tottenham Hotspur versus Aston Villa. Aston Villa, another one of the newly promoted clubs. I actually quite like Aston Villa. I also like Spurs. Nothing against them personally. VAR, it's over now. Get over it, Rob. Okay, Tottenham at home, Aston Villa. I actually think Aston Villa are going to have a good season this year, but unfortunately, they're away. First game of the season against Tottenham. Welcome to the Premier League. Tottenham, 3-0. Get over it, Villa. Move on. You've got tougher tests that you can pass this season. Okay, so let's move on to the Sunday games. The 2 o'clock kickoffs on the Sunday. Leicester City versus Wolverhampton Wanderers. This, for Brenda Rodgers, is going to be a big season. Can he do it in a real league? Who knows? Wolverhampton Wanderers. A lot of people I've spoke to think that they can't repeat possibly what they did last season. Those doubters are wrong, although this is not the game for them. I think this will be a 2 all draw. Newcastle United versus Arsenal. Lacazette, Aubameyang, Pepe, two of the real those guys are in my dream team, my fantasy football that I'm going to smash this season, by the way. And I think Arsenal are going to go to Newcastle and actually turn up this time and smash them 3-0. And what about the last game, the half-past four kickoff? This was 10 years ago, billed as a top-of-the-table fixture. Now it is a team in mid-table obscurity with some unknown Norwegian bus driver versus Frankie Lampard's Chelsea. He's not playing for them anymore, so they're nowhere near as good. And they've lost half the players to Arsenal for some reason. And they can't sign anybody and they've got a bunch of kids out. Who knows? But it could be an exciting half past four kickoff on a Sunday. A derby, a mid-table clash. A big mid-table clash with Ole at the wheel and Frankie steering the Chelsea ship. Let's see. Okay, this is going to be an incredibly tough one to judge. I'm probably the only one I'm going to get wrong. But I am going to go for Manchester United 3, Chelsea 2. So just so you can see all my predictions on one page there, starting with the Friday night game, we've got Liverpool versus Norwich, which I predicted as a 5-0 home win for Liverpool. Then on to the Saturday fixtures, starting with Manchester City versus West Ham. Manchester City away from home, I predicted a 3-1 away win for Manchester City. And then Bournemouth against Sheffield United, a 2 all draw I've predicted. Burnley versus Southampton, a 2-1 home win for Burnley. Crystal Palace versus Everton, I predicted a 2-1 away win for Everton. Watford versus Brighton, a 2-1 home win for Watford. Tottenham versus Aston Villa, a 3-0 home win for Tottenham. Leicester versus Wolves, a 2 all draw. Newcastle versus Arsenal, a 3-0 away win for Arsenal. And finally, Manchester United versus Chelsea, a 3-2 home win for Manchester United. So what do you guys think? Have I done a pretty good job of predicting the opening weekend fixtures? Have I got some fixtures really wrong? Have I, have I misassessed the situation on some? Why don't you tell me about these key fixtures? Tell me about the Liverpool game. What do you think the Liverpool game score is going to be? What about the Manchester City game? Are we really going to win 3-1 away from home against West Ham? Or have I got that one wrong? And then how about that United versus Chelsea clash? That's a tasty tie on the opening weekend. Are Man United really going to win 3-2? Please tell me down in the comments underneath this video. I'd really like to know what you guys have to say. All right, guys. So, because we're coming into a brand new Premier League season, 
There's one last topic that we really need to discuss, and that is the rule changes and the introduction of VAR for the 2019-2020 season. As you all know, VAR will give match officials an opportunity to have a look at incidents during the game and even change their decisions. They've got a three replay limit, believe it or not, so that means when they, if they do decide or they've been informed via their earpiece to go over to monitor on the side of the pitch, they can they can only look at an incident three times, and they've got to make their mind up in that within that period of time there's some rule changes that are a little bit strange in my opinion so celebrations there's a new rule involving celebrations so basically as you already know if a player sort of has an over exuberant celebration or runs into the crowd or takes the shirt off or any of that sort of stuff currently they're booked or even in the case of Raheem Sterling red carded even though he was still on the pitch we can all let these things go Rob now player can be booked if they score and celebrate and even if, and then if that goal then gets disallowed by VAR, they can still be punished for that exuberant celebration, which is a bit odd. Handballs is something that's completely different now. So if a ball hits an attacker's arm during the build-up to a goal, it will be disallowed regardless of if it was accidental or otherwise. So Sergio Aguero scored a goal which rebounded off his arm against Arsenal to complete a hat-trick last season, and that won't be given. It was handball, then, then, or even if he'd like say, no, it wasn't handball or whatever, that goal won't be given now. Free kicks, so attacking players are no longer allowed to stand in the wall on free kicks, so this one's a bit weird. Opponents have to stand at least a metre away, that's going to be, I think this is going to be the absolute killer for the Premier League, because how impossible is it to regulate walls as it is? They've got that shit, they've got that fancy bloody spray. And it's all completely rubbish. People encroach anyway. People jump. I can just imagine situations where people are going to be lying down in front of walls and pushing a ball back a little bit further back or lying down behind walls or bloody standing behind walls or just there's going to be incidents probably of obstructing the goalkeeper's view. There's just going to be all sorts of nonsense with that one. So I was always okay with having attacking players in walls, but no, that's a new rule change now. So attacking players are now no longer allowed in the wall at a free click. They claim that it will cause less jostling between attacking and defending players. I just think it's stupid. That's just my personal opinion anyway. So penalty kicks, as we saw, if anyone watched the women's, the women's World Cup, when Scotland got knocked out quite unfairly, a goalkeeper must keep one foot on the line while the penalty is being taken so they can dance around and do whatever they want as long as that one foot remains on the line. <sighs> Keepers are apparently are now no longer allowed to touch the posts or the frame of the goal before a penalty is taken. So that's a really weird one, apparently to, to, to stop mind games or reduce mind games. That's Premier League officials, you know, actually focus on getting some good officials before you get to this sort of stuff. Anyway, so, yep, as you saw in the Community Shield, managers now can receive yellow cards and also red cards, obviously, if they get a second offence or I guess if they just do something straight up that's ridiculous straight away, like punch, a, punch the fourth official or something, they can... They can get a red card. These accumulate uh, like a player's yellow card one. So, you know, that they have to sit... They, they, they can get a fine and a touchline ban for a game if they get if they accumulate a certain number of cards. So it'll take four, four of these yellow cards to receive a one-match ban. And if they accumulate eight, that'll earn you a further two games on top of the one-match ban you already received. Goal kicks. The ball is now active the second it leaves the goalkeeper's foot in a, in a goal kick situation. So, yeah, you work that one out. Teammates of the goalkeeper or the attacker from the opposition no longer have to wait until the ball leaves the penalty area. So that's going to be a crazy situation, potentially, especially with... I wonder if that's like a rule brought in specifically to target the way that Manchester City play football, seeing as we like playing out from the back and we like putting the ball on the floor. I can just imagine a situation where the opposition team is just going to line up outside the penalty area. Mind you, Edison could just, you just smash it over the reds long. He can play the ball on a dime, that guy. So I'm not too worried about the one, I guess. Yeah, so the goalkeeper can, can drop kick the ball or throw it out of his area. Drop balls, the old style of drop balls is not used anymore. Referees will be giving a ball back to the last team in possession after it stops. So apparently sportsmanship and all the rest of it is a, is, is a dying art. Substitutions players so you know you're all used to seeing Sergio Aguero take 45 minutes to leave the field of play now unfortunately Sergio you're gonna have to just leave the field of play 
at the closest point. Hopefully, Sergio is a genius and he knows when he's about to get substituted and he just goes over to the centre spot and then just does his usual slow walk off the pitch anyway because that would be hilarious. So apparently it's been introduced uh, so that players from on the opposite sides of the pitch walk into the far, far dugout late in, in games, right? So if, if imagine if you're in the top corner as far away as possible from the, 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 the dugout instead of going 45 yards across the pitch, you've just got to leave at the corner flag and walk around, so whatever. I wonder if they've cited Sergio Aguero was the reason for that, but what I'm, I have no idea. Ridiculous. Head to head. So here we go. So this is how you settle the league now, just in case two teams finish level on points and goal difference and goals against and all the rest of it. Let's say, for example, City and Liverpool finish on the same points. The same goal difference, same goals scored and same goals conceded. But let's say that we lost the game against the Brighton or something like that and Liverpool lost against us, then we would automatically win the league because we had a better head-to-head record than Liverpool. So the old rule was that if, if teams finished equal on all of those aforementioned points, uh, they'd, they'd be like a playoff game, but it's never actually happened. And I think it was just because last season was so close that this has sort of been muted now and now introduced as a new rule. And that's about it. Those are about the only things you really need to be paying attention for for the coming season. VAR, of course, is going to be a very definite suck it and see. I think five years from now, VAR is probably going to be streamlined and absolutely perfect. I think for this this season in particular, it's going to cause so many talking points. And I'm sure Andy will do videos on it. And I'm sure the media themselves, Sky, BBC, TalkSport and all the rest of those people will all just be hammering nails in the coffin of the AR before it's got a chance to have a go at life. But I really think it's going to be one of those things that you just got to bear with and in five seasons time you won't even remember it being a controversial thing because it'll be streamlined by then. It takes time. I mean we all remember the VAR from the, the Men's World Cup in 2018 and it's definitely improved since then and it's only going to go on. The only strange thing that I think about VAR is the fact that the Champions League VAR is going to be different than the Premier League VAR slightly but we'll see. So that is about that. We've covered about everything we need to cover in time for the new Premier League season. I am so very excited because it means I get to go and watch my beloved Manchester City again. Can't wait. Hopefully, this is the third league title in a row for Manchester City. Oh my God, how great would that be? So, We've covered the, the opening game for Manchester City on Saturday against West Ham away. We've covered what I think the rest of the Premier League opening weekend fixtures will turn out like. And I've also given you there like a brief rundown about VAR and the new rules for the 2019-2020 season. Now, if you guys want a proper in-depth video about the new rules and about VAR, maybe we can look at doing one of those. Tell me in the comments if it's something you're interested in. I think it's really boring, but I mean, obviously it's a necessary part of football, but it's really boring because we all just love playing football and we hate every single time the referee makes a bad decision and we know that VAR is going to make some bad decisions and some of those things there that they just they cited in the rule changes are just like a goalkeeper can't touch his posts before a person takes a penalty it just seems so pointless but whatever so you know if you if you want me to look into it in more detail and, and do a, do an in-depth analysis or a video on VAR and the new rule sets let me know in the comments definitely please let me know about what you think the opening weekend predictions are going to be for your predictions I really want to know what you guys think the scores will be for those games and just enjoy the football this weekend guys do me a favor if you like the videos if you like any of the videos that we do please like on the videos because it really helps us it gives us a good indication as to whether the content we're producing is good for you guys uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already subscribed and if you hit that notification bell, the notification bell, basically, every single time we go live with a video, because Andy likes doing his live streams, or any time that we publish content like this, you guys will know straight away. So then, obviously, you can watch it whenever you want. I hope you like the video, guys. Thank you very much for watching it, and I will see you on the next one.